And joining us now on the debate, Bob Ray, leader of the Liberal Party of Canada and the MP for Toronto Centre. David Miller, former mayor of Toronto, now counsel at the Toronto law firm Airden Burles. Marilyn Shirley, former Ontario NDP cabinet minister and MPP for Toronto Danforth, Jack Layton's riding. Brian Topp, president of the New Democratic Party of Canada. And Jonathan Kay, editor of the comments pages at the National Post. Just a reminder, our fifth column blogger Mike Miner is now hosting a live chat on the Inside Agenda Producers blog. That's on our homepage, tvo.org slash the agenda. So please feel free to visit that website and share your thoughts on Jack Layton's legacy. And I welcome everybody around this table on what is a sad day for Canada. Uh, Brian, uh, you, I guess, probably met with him most recently and were closest in terms of a daily working relationship with him. So I'm going to start with you. How'd you get the news? I got the news in a, uh, a very sad email this morning, although I'd seen Jack quite recently. I, w I visited with him for most of, the, uh, most of the afternoon on Saturday, and um, you know, I knew that he was very ill indeed. But I have to tell you that although he called us together in, a, I think, a, a typically Jack Layton moment, you know, people who know him laugh about this because it was, assemble the team, right? And it was, assemble the team, and then it was, I want to know what the options are. And by this time around, the options were, what happens if I can't continue? And what happens if I can? Are you and saying that up until two days ago, he still thought he was going to beat this thing? He hoped he could. And so, but he, he was being responsible, I think, in asking himself, what happens if I can't? And so we spent the afternoon together, um, myself and Anne McGrath, his chief of staff, and Olivia, and we had a careful talk about what it means if you couldn't continue. And it led to quite a long conversation and a very moving one, if I may say so, which led to the, that letter that he issued, which I think, I must say, I. I'm quite proud that he did that. And we also talked about his hopes and dreams. He was hoping he could beat it. He was hoping he knew he would need more time if he did. But unfortunately, that was not to be. And uh, it was quite a privilege to be there, I must say. I, I got to see the, I've seen them before. I've been visiting with them through the summer. But one last time to see the, uh, the amazing power and love in that house, the wonderful family he's got, and the, the support he got from them. It was really quite, uh, quite a day. Bob Ray, without being uh, overly maudlin about this, you've seen your share of personal tragedy in your life. Your in-laws, your brother all died prematurely, and now this one too. Your reaction today? Well, it's a very, it's very, tough, uh, very tough day. I mean, I, I, uh, I think like everybody, when I saw Jack on television the, the, the day he made his announcement about taking a leave, I, I think I realized very quickly, like just bang, you know, that, that this was a different challenge from the one that we'd all thought that he had, that he'd had this prostate and then he'd had this hip problem and he was going and he went through the election and he was incredible. And I mean, he was flagging a bit in the house at the end and he was clearly getting a bit tired. And I talked to him about that and said, you know, have a good summer, take it easy, do what you can to, to, to take your time. And, uh, you know, he, he, when I think I saw that, I was, and I, but I was still shocked today because I, 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 I felt that, you know, you always hope that you know, there's going to be a, a, re a remission and a recovery, and it's going to happen, and it can happen. Uh, but it, it, it didn't. And I, I, I think that um, at a very personal level, uh, you know, I see a sort of parallel between what the political experience that Jack had and that I had, that you start, you know, you th you're, you're never quite certain what's going to happen. Uh, but all of a sudden, in the middle of an election campaign, after your second or third try, people suddenly look at you differently and they start talking about you differently and all of a sudden the crowds get bigger and bigger and happened bigger. Happened to you, happened to him. It happened to me in 1990. And, uh, you know, the wind uh, catches your sails and you just, you're there. And I could see it happening. Uh, I tell you, it's much nicer when it's happening to you than when it's not happening, when it's happening against you because I could feel it happening in my own riding in this last election when I, you know, I ran as a liberal. And I, I, think, uh, I think Jack handled it with great, a plum. I think he. I know what he. What he. What he and his team did in Quebec was a remarkable political achievement. I mean, nobody can, you know, gainsay that and say, well, it didn't mean anything. He sort of said, "That's. I'm sorry. That's a significant political change in the country, and to become the leader of the official opposition against all odds. I mean, everybody. Should, nobody should forget how quickly things changed. Three weeks into the election, he was 15 points behind, and uh, nobody gave him gave him a a chance of breaking through. In fact, the first week of the campaign, there was a lot of chatter, background about, you know, what's, you know, how's he going to be able to run a campaign and how's it going to go. So I, I think it's a remarkable story. And I, I think Jack, I mean, knowing him as I've done for Maryland, and we go back going, 
I mean, Jack was an auctioneer, and it was a political auctioneer, you know, fundraising and selling stuff. There's always been a, a salesman side to Jack. There's always been a showman side to Jack. I happen to think that's an important part of politics. I, I, I believe those are important political skills. And I think in the end, I think what happened with Canadians, I think they looked at a guy and said, this is a guy who knows politics, who understands what it is to be a politician. And, and they rewarded him accordingly. And rewarded him for his effort and because they, they saw it as a chance to, they didn't particularly like what else was on offer. And, mm -hmm. and I, I, I think you, he's, he's made a huge contribution uh, to our political life. We're going to go into that a bit more as we go along in the discussion. Marilyn, let me, uh, let me ask you to tell us about the text message that you got at 6.45 this morning. Um, Olivia, I was up north. Um, seems like uh, I, when he first announced that his another, a secondary cancer had happened, I was in my hometown of Labrador. And for this, well, Olivia uh, text messaged me and said that he had passed away. And uh, she told me that he had the orange, the soft orange blankie that I had sent him, just delivered to him a few days ago, next to him in bed. And, uh, it was very touching because, um, as you know, I'm very close to Jack, and um, the fact that I couldn't be there. I saw him about uh, two weeks ago, and uh, we had a really good chat. It's true what, true what Brian said. He was weak, but he was hopeful. And I'll tell you something about Jack. You never go to Jack with a problem without some options. Brian would know this, never. You always say, here's the problem, but here's what we're going to do about it. And that was, I know, from my chat with Jack, he knew it was dire, but his options were to keep on fighting and to keep on loving. When I walked in that, in that room and saw him sitting there, he was so thin, but those big blue eyes, and I thought I was going to fall to the floor. His appearance was so shocking. And those big blue eyes that we all know leaped out at me, and he said in such a joyous voice, Marilyn. I'm so glad to see you. And the real Jack, the Jack that we know, just leaped out of him and embraced me with his, his mind and his and soul and everything. He was just so there going through all of this and so happy to see me. And we had a, such a great conversation. You say a joyous voice. Was it, was, not, voice so not was, the voice that it, he had at the last press conference, which was so somber. gravelly? And no, he was so happy to see. It was, a, it was a weak voice, no question. He was going through a very, very serious illness and treatments and things. But his voice was full of joy and happiness to see me. And we had, we had just a, a great conversation about all the great things and fun things we'd done together. and you know, his legacy, but he never talked about his legacy. He talked about our legacy, what we've done together, not just he and I, but we and Canadians and the party was all about positive and about that. Just a little background. You two were on Toronto City Council together for a yes. short while, yes. and you were the MPP while he was the MP yes. in Toronto Danforth. That's right, and I was the co-chair of his NDP leadership campaign, So, and we we're very close friends. Lots we, of crossover. We shared a lot of bottles of red wine together. <laughs> David Miller, how did you get the news? Um, <clears throat> actually, my wife Jill got the news. She got a phone call. You know, I was Monday morning's my gym morning, and as you know, Steve, we were on holiday till yesterday. We got back quite late. I got up early, went to the gym, and came back. And uh, Jill was uh, very somber, and, and she'd gotten the call. And I, um, I found it incredibly sad. But I think what hit me emotionally was his press conference a month or so ago. Like Bob, uh, my family's been struck by cancer. My mom uh, passed away uh, ten years ago, next month actually. And when I saw Jack at that press conference, uh, and I was watching it over the internet at my office at Aaron Burles, I just started crying. Because you could see if you've known people who are incredibly courageous, who are suffering from cancer, uh, you, you knew that that was, he was in a grim situation. And I, I had to say that, have to say that uh, the courage he showed in doing that press conference, I thought was remarkable. Uh, the strength he would have had to summon to do it. And the statement it said to people, other Canadians, like he did in his statement that was uh, issued today, um, to other Canadians who are suffering from cancer, that you can fight. Ignoring the politics for a moment, what a powerful thing for somebody in that position to do. And I was incredibly moved by it. And it was one of the first things I thought about this morning when I, I got the news. John Cade, journalists are really not supposed to have any feelings about the stories they cover. But if you've watched television today, mm -hmm. There's been a lot of journalists expressing a lot of feelings. What's going on out there? It's interesting. It's um, the first time since 9-11 
I've observed one of my colleagues cry uh, upon hearing of a, a news story. Somebody at the Post? Yeah. Um, and it's, it's interesting. I, um, again, you know, it's, obviously it's not a tragedy on the scale of 9-11, but there was something about the death that affected people, and I think it has to do with the fact that he was such a positive guy. Um, because when you see someone who's so positive, so upbeat, get struck down, it sort of destroys the myth that positive thinking and energy can ward off any evil. Because we all carry this myth that if, if we have the right attitude, we can get through any challenge. But Jack embodied this, this optimism, um, this, this energy that we've been talking about. And if he, even he can get struck down by cancer, it destroys this myth that we're invulnerable. So I think there was the sadness about him, and also it caused people to reflect on their own lives and, and mortality in that. And even jaded journalists, in some cases, and even at the National Post, uh, had a very emotional reaction. Uh, I know on a day like today, we're never supposed to say a single negative thing or suggest that there was anything ever wrong with the man's life. However, Bob Ray, comma, you two were New Democrats at the same time, but you weren't always bosom buddies at the same time. And in fact, you were on opposite sides of a lot of issues when you were New Democrats at the same time. You think about that stuff today? Uh, no, uh, not really. I mean, uh, Jack, I mean, Jack was... Jack was Jack. I mean, he was an activist at the municipal level. There were things he wanted, uh, things to happen that uh, some things we, I thought we could do, other things that were a little more difficult. But on the other hand, if you look, for example, at two or three things where we worked very closely together on the housing agenda, for example, uh, we worked long and hard on the housing agenda. We had, you know, between 1985 and, and 1995, we had a very progressive housing agenda in the province, partly during the Accord government, partly during the Peterson government, partly during my government. Jack had a lot to do with that, had a lot to do with the homelessness thing. I, I don't, I'm not even, even today, even af, having asked that question and given me the opportunity, I'm, I'm not going to make any political commentary on, on Jack's life or on political differences with Jack. I mean, I, 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 uh, I had some and still have some. Obviously, you know, he, he, he became the leader of the New Democratic Party and I, I, I left the New Democratic Party in 1998 and and never returned, and then ran as a liberal in 2006. So, you know, there are How clearly... How do you regard that? Um, well, it's interesting. Uh, there are some New Democrats, I won't mention any names. Are you uh, sitting beside one of them? No, I'm not. Oh, okay. I'm absolutely not. Just checking. Some New Democrats regard it as sort of an act of terrible, you know, apostasy, betrayal, treason, uh, and a kind of, you know, you've joined the other side, and I I'll, I'll, would, would make a point of crossing the street or would not have much civil to say to me. Uh, Jack was completely the opposite. Um, Jack, uh, without hesitation, said, Bob, you've made your choice. I don't agree with it. Uh, I, think you're, I think you're wrong. I think I'll prove you're wrong. Uh, but I respect you, and I like you, and I like your family. I like what you've done. Uh, and I'm not going to ever going to attack you personally. And he never did. He never, never descended to that. And he, and he never, I don't think he ever wanted to. And frankly, you know, in terms of the years since 2006, there have been lots of opportunities for us to work together <laughs> uh, to kind of have a direct communication about political change, uh, one of which, regrettably, in my view, didn't happen uh, in 2008. And I don't make any apologies for saying that I, I think a mistake was made when we didn't, when we didn't continue with uh, a process of political change in 2008. Uh, and Is he and I reference to the coalition absolutely, and he okay. and I talked about that, and and uh, remained in direct communication about those things, and and I you know and and yet I, I there were things that he said in the house, and there are steps that he took and positions that he took with which I disagreed, but unlike many many people in the political process, and I think more today than when I began my political career a little while ago, uh, there was no personal rancor in, in his relationship with me. And that was not unique to me. I mean, he had, he, had a, he had a very good personal relationship, a respectful relationship with Michael Ignatiev. And he had a respectful relationship with, with a lot of other, with Stephen Harper. I mean, he didn't... He you know didn't, what the PM said today? Yeah, exactly he, right. He, he regrets the fact that they'll never have this chance to have no. a jam session together? Well, yeah, he's had, he's had lots of opportunities to do that. <laughs> you know, I think... I think there would be other reasons the prime minister wouldn't do that, but I, I, I do think that uh, he, he has that ability. Uh, that I, I think we one thing I would say is we need more of that. I think the fact that that you people have to recognize that 
politics comes out of compromise. And I think it was his municipal experience. I heard David mentioning this today. I think it's absolutely right. that The fact that Jack started out as a municipal guy, and I think if he'd been able to get elected mayor, I think he would have seen that as a very important you know, achievement for himself. Uh, I think it's when he, that avenue was closed, when he ran for mayor uh, and was not successful a couple of times, that he then decided to say, well, let me, let me try this other thing that I want to see if I can do. Uh, and, and I think that when he, uh, at the municipal level in those days, I got a wonderful email today from David Crombie, who was remembering when he was a federal member and I was a federal member, and Jack was a municipal councillor, and you know how how things worked out in those days. And it was not unusual to have a beer or have a chat or have a conversation and know that you know you were not I'll always going to agree, but you try to solve mm -hmm. a problem. He had this tremendous sense. I mean, Marilyn mentioned this. I think it's very important. He always wanted to find a solution. I mean, he was. I mean, he would even when there was no deal to be done, he'd say, "What's the deal here?" I'd say, "Jack, there's no. <laughs> apparently, there's no deal to be done here. There's nothing can be done." He'd say, "There's got to be a deal. Like we can't just walk away from the table here." Unusual right? for an opposition politician to think. Very. That way. And he. The other thing I just want to say this because I, I I can't stay for the whole program, but just want to say, the thing that I respect in him a great deal professionally as a politician, is that he never allowed having been in opposition so long to corrode him. I, I, I haven't got enough fingers on my hand to, 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 to mention or to talk about how being in opposition for a long time, I mean, Mr. Trudeau used to say power corrupts, and he said, so does powerlessness. Powerlessness also corrupts, because <laughs> it can make you bitter and, and just oppositional. Jack was never that way. I mean, he loved minority parliaments, because it gave him a chance to kind of get stuff done and try to make a difference. And uh, uh, so I, I think his... his, his, his and I think this is why Canadians responded to him the way they did. I think it's because they saw in him a kind of everyman, a very positive guy, the kind of guy who would just say, let's go in and how can we do this and how can we make it happen? And that was, that was not fake. That was the real Jack. That was absolutely what Jack was like. He was, unlike most of us, he was exactly the same in private as he was in public. I didn't see a different... Somebody said to me, what was the real Jack Layton like? I'd say, whatever you saw. What you saw was what you got. It was there. That was him. Mr. Ray, we do want to thank you for coming in this evening. Thank we you. know you have another engagement Apologize to get to. Apologize for having to leave. Not at all. We're going to play a little piece of tape from one of Jack Layton's best days in politics to allow you to sneak out, but we will <laughs> thank, thank you for coming Appreciate in this evening. It. Appreciate it. Thank you. Here's Jack Layton with 100-plus NDP MPs newly minted standing around him. Mr. Ray's walking right We're going to shop. earn the go. trust that they have placed in us. Canadians coming over from other parties looking for practical, reasonable solutions to the problems they face. New Canadians looking for the focus to be put on their priorities. Young Canadians who want better from their country and their government. Every day, New Democrats will give a voice to these Canadians in this Parliament. There's a lot to do. Now, what do you say? Are we up for it? <laughs> Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. First speech to the new NDP caucus after the Maysav second election. 100 plus of them in the room, never a caucus that big before. Were you in that room? I was, and I have to tell you, I can remember when the NDP caucus used to sit around a table just about this size. <laughs> and uh, that was a beautiful change, let me tell you. That was a fabulous moment. But, you know, I was listening to uh, Bob Ray just talking about how um, Canadians responded to his willingness to work with other people, and I just think that it's worth saying, because it's little remarked on in English Canada, I think that. Specifically, the 2008 coalition proposal that Jack Layton proposed is one of the keys to his breakthrough in Quebec. That that move was quite popular in Quebec, and the slogan that we ran under there, which was Travaillons ensemble, let's work together, um, hit a note with Quebecers who were looking for something new, or saying sending 50 empty seats to Parliament maybe doesn't make any sense after 20 years, and we're looking for something new. And that theme of reaching out, of working with other people, uh, which was, by the way, his most popular trait as a leader in English Canada as well. But people, when you ask people in public opinion polling, what do you like most about the guy? They point at that. I like the way he works with other people in the province. That delivered 59 seats in the province of Quebec and positioned the New Democrats to be a step away from government. And Steve, the, the, I, I think you know some people seem to see this as all a surprise that the NDP had a breakthrough in Quebec, had a breakthrough nationally. These things don't happen accidentally. Uh, right. The party worked tremendously hard under Jack's leadership to do that. 
And I think one of the reasons um, uh, Brian and, and Bob both touched on was because of his background in city politics, which is much more consensual. And in particular, the fact that he was elected by councillors and mayors from across Canada to be the president of the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. A city councillor from downtown Toronto who's a partisan member of the NDP gets elected by people who are conservatives, liberals, New Democrats and independents uh, to be their leader. And he did an incredible job um, as the president of, of FCM. He covered this country and he knew Canada intimately. And he, he was able to bring people from those different regions and different political stripes together around a common agenda in the way we've been talking about, because that's what Jack does. He tries to find a solution to a problem. And, and I think that experience allowed him to be a very effective national leader, because he understood the country, he understood the problems, how they're expressed in different areas, and he also understood how to bring people together around a common cause. And you don't get a party... Uh, surging like this completely by accident. And I think Jack's leadership was instrumental, although he had very talented people working with him, because of that understanding which he gained because he was a municipal politician and because FCM showed confidence in him uh, by, by making him the president. And he also produced incredible results, which is probably a different point. But I, I think that underlay a lot of the success and the groundwork was laid then. He has an instinct. And he had an instinct in Quebec because he's a Quebecer and he speaks Quebec French and understands people. He had an instinct for other parts of the country, and I think that wasn't very much appreciated, uh, but sure was seen in the election results. Marilyn? Uh, just listening to everybody, um, Jack, the, uh, Bob said something else that I, I thought was so true, that, and some of you may have experienced this over a glass or two of wine with Jack after an event evenings. I would lose my cool from time to time and call somebody, I'm sure you're surprised, the son, of a, I have, the son of a whatever. Yeah. I hardly ever heard Jack say a bad word about anybody, and this is the truth. I mean, I'd try to get him to. Um, you know this. It was very difficult to have one of the, oh, he'd say, oh, you know. Yes, but n never mind that, Marilyn. Let's look at this. It's the same kind of thing. He, he was genuine that way. He really was, had a positive reaction and he looked for the best in people. And when people say with Jack, what you saw is what you, you got, it's true in private li life. Now I have to say, as a dear friend, uh, there, there's a few things. He had a very goofy sense of humor. And, uh, and he was a very... Examples? Uh, no, I won't give any examples, <laughs> but he really did like to laugh and he could be very sentimental. You know, and, and um, he was very upset after I won, lost uh, the first federal election I ran in, in Beaches East York. And, um, Y'all were actually. Uh, well, thank you for that. <laughs> but Jack and I went out, and I guess I feel the need to talk about some personal stuff about Jack as, as a friend. He, um, we were holding hands, and, 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 and you know, we were both crying. I mean, Jack. When is this? Uh, after your after, first loss? In Beaches East York in 2000. When you ran federally. Yeah, the first time, okay. federally. But he was a sentimental guy. He, uh, he loved his granddaughter, Beatrice, so much. Really so much. And his wife, Olivia. Well, anybody who's been around, Jack and Olivia, I don't think I've ever seen anybody love another human being as much as that man loved that woman. John, I mean, can I get you to talk about something that I've received a lot of emails and tweets about today, which is this idea of his son Mike runs for city council back in October and wins. Uh, he has the best showing in NDP history. Uh, he seems to beat back this prostate cancer. This cane becomes an icon by which he connects with so many people. And at the moment when he should be celebrating both professional and family triumphs as never before, this happens. What do you say? Yeah, I mean, there's something, it's almost like something in a tragic novel. Um, although I, I should say the death itself, uh, although it came decades too soon, um, was a good death in the sense he was surrounded by the people he loved. Um, and here we are singing his praises. And, uh, you know, he, he obviously did things that, that are praiseworthy. And um, it's tragic that it happened when it did. There, as I say, it, it does seem like something concocted for a novel. Um, I do think that people will speak of him for decades to come uh, because of his legacy, um, including uh, driving the possibility of a merger between the Liberals and the NDP. I think if and when Canada becomes a two-party system, uh, whether it happens in five years or 10 years or 20 years, I think people will look to Jack Layton and say it was his energy, 
uh, it was his vision of, of the NDP as a viable national party for government um, that, that will be part of it. I, I think this is not the last time people will talk about Leighton. I think they'll still be talking about him uh, for a generation to come. Hmm. I, I want to talk a bit, if I can, about the transition that he seemed to make. Because when, when I was a little kid covering Toronto City Council back in 1982, which was the year he first got elected, he was known for being a bit of a camera hog, a bit chippy, a bit in-your-face aggressive to get attention for the issues that he cared about. But clearly over the years, David Miller, he made some kind of transition to, you know, the guy everybody likes, the guy you want to have a beer with, the guy who's unbelievably comfortable in his own skin. How'd that transition happen? Well, I, I think, I mean, first of all, if you're an elected official and you have a message that you powerfully believe in, and if, if Jack was anything, he was somebody who was incredibly passionate about his beliefs and about Olivia and his family. He had two loves. Um, when, you're, when you're that kind of person, you're going to want to be in front of the camera. So, you know, I, yes, sure, that was criticism of people in the past, but it, it's a legitimate thing for an elected official to try to get their message out. And Jack was just very, very good at it. And I think sometimes people were critical because there was a little uh, perhaps jealousy there about how effective he was Absolutely. at getting his message out. And don't forget, in those times also, he took some pretty hard knocks that were totally unfair because he took unpopular positions. And I don't blame him at all for, for finding ways to get in front of the media. I think it was a great gift he had. But yes, it's true. I, I think he mellowed. And, and part of that was, transition I saw in him was um, he, he succeeded. He managed to make change in things he passionately believed in. You know, when, when uh, my predecessor was the mayor of Toronto, Mel Lastman, uh, Jack made a lot of progress on, on fighting homelessness. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, we got a resolution through council that uh, declared it a national emergency. And Jack led that charge, but found a way to work with everybody to get it through. And he, what he cared about was making the change he believed in. And yes, in his early days, he did that with a certain style. I don't think he ever really changed that style. You know, he had a lot of charisma, and he loved the mic. And my mom used to say, oh, he's so handsome, David. He's so <laughs> handsome. Um, bless her soul. Um, but he, he found a way to accomplish things. And I, I was intrigued that Bob Ray mentioned the Accord. Very interesting. Just because a, a reminder for people who haven't been in this province all that long, 1985 to 1987, the agreement between the Peterson Liberals and the then Bob Ray led New Democrats on a program for two years. And then became... Uh, you know, then became the government. And sorry, I meant, what I meant was the, the um, Stéphane Dion. Oh, the coalition. The coalition. Sorry. I took you off track there. Well, I used the wrong word. <laughs> um, so it's my problem, not yours. But it was intriguing that Bob mentioned that because that was a sign of, of uh, the more mature Jack. And we all, we all grow up. And in municipal politics, you know, I, I hate to belabor this theme, but you have to work with everybody. Um, and if you don't, you can't get anything done. And Jack learned that and I think applied it to national politics. Um, and the coalition was a, was a very powerful example of that. Brian, can you talk about that transition from a guy who was kind of in your face a lot as a city councillor to this avuncular, everybody loves him, they want to have a beer with him, Le Bon Jack? You know, it's worth remembering that he got into municipal politics out of university. He was a university professor. And um, if you uh, listen, read his stuff and, and look at what he was saying then, he, he came in as a policy expert. He was fascinated by the issues and he had studied them in university and he he was a policy wonk, and um, very much as we were just hearing, you don't have to spend a lot of time in city council or anywhere in politics without realizing that at the end of the day, what you really need to get things done is build relationships, and you need to build coalitions, you need to find out where people's interests are and assemble them, and uh, his municipal training. And the fact, by the way, that he did get much done municipally by using those tactics did teach him to get out of the books and get out of the policy papers and into the people. And by the way, if I put out another thought, I'm sure you'll agree with this, sister. Yeah. <laughs> he had a beautiful natural talent for it. He did. I'll offer you a little example. I, uh, you were poking me about this just before the show. Um, I was sitting with my wife this morning, and we were asking ourselves, what's our favorite Jack story? And it was going into the 2008 election, I called a strategy meeting in my house. I wanted it in my house so that nobody would ever know that it was happening. Jack was there, but the senior folks in that campaign. And a few of us had an idea. We said, why don't we stop being representational? Why don't we stop saying, we'll fight for you? Why don't we stop saying, vote for us and you'll get lots of press releases? And why don't, what if we said, vote for us and you get a new government? Vote for me and you get a new prime minister. What if we take on the old line parties, nose to nose, and seek to replace them? And so there was a discussion about that. That was a controversial idea for a while in the Democrats, you know? Oh, we'll scare people. And uh, he listened to about 10 minutes of that. And then he intervened as follows. He said, uh, 
I don't understand this discussion. I was always running for prime minister, didn't you notice? <laughs> and I always wanted us to win in government. I hope that, that we all agree on that now. Then he looked at my eight-year-old son who was listening on this and he said, do you play piano? And he said, no, but I wish I did. Have you got a piano in the house? There's one in the living room. Let's go. And he stood up with my eight-year-old whose eyes were wide as saucers. And off they went together. And next thing you know, the whole house was full of this demented piano music as the leader of the party tried to do two things. First of all, he reached out to my eight-year-old son and gave him a moment that he will never forget his whole life. Mm -hmm. You're right and about secondly, that. Yes. and he always did that all the time. And secondly, in the nicest possible way, he let us know that the meeting was over. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, is, that's the man. Go ahead. Go ahead. Then I have a story to tell. In Good. terms of the way he connected with people, I, I think I might be unique in this gathering in that he was my MP. And um, uh, I, I live in uh, the Danforth here in Toronto. So I must have been your MPP. Uh, I think you were. Uh, and um, I, um, I actually live two blocks from your office. Um, and I interacted with him as a constituent before I was, you know, a, a third-rate journalist or whatever I am now. And, About uh, what? Uh, I, <laughs> it's a crazy story. I actually wanted a, um, this is when he was an MP, I wanted a, a speed bump on my street. Now, it's not federal jurisdiction. But I'd gotten all the signatures on my street, and I was having a hard time with City Hall. And uh, I started phoning politicians, including him. And even though this was the farthest thing from a federal jurisdiction, he took my call, and he spent 20 minutes on the phone. He said, now, look, listen, I used to be in the city of Toronto. I know how these things are done. It's very bureaucratic. He stepped me through the process. And during that phone call, uh, it was like I was the only person in his world. Mm -hmm. And I've heard this, this set of successful politicians. I've heard it said, Bill Clinton, when, he, when Bill Clinton was talking to you were the only person in his world. And he made you think that nothing else mattered and that whatever your little parochial problem was, that was, that was his world. And during that phone call, I gotta say, Leighton made me feel that way. And I got a phone, now I didn't get the speed bump and for all I know, he was you know, doing 100 different, you know, was blackberrying and talking to other people, but he, made, he connected with me. And a lot of the times when people talk about politicians as camera hogs, or attention hogs, they're talking about people who have a need to connect with other people. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they connect with a million people on television, and sometimes they connect one-on-one. -on -one. And I gotta say, the, the focus and the magnetism he had during that phone call, uh, it was just the same as the Jack Layton you saw on TV. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was focused, and he was creating a political connection with me. Did you get the speed bump? I never got the speed bump. Can, can uh, I just yeah. say, Go ahead, add one Maryland. thing to that? Yeah. Because I think Jonathan made a really powerful point. Um, in that moment, uh, you were the only thing he was yeah. thinking about. And, and that was a gift Jack had, a, an incredible focus. Um, uh, I mean, speed humps are... Uh, <laughs> Don't get me started. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but, but, you know, he, he did have that gift, and I thought you put it really well. But it was because it was real. It wasn't, he, was, he wouldn't have been, uh, well, Jack's always on his Blackberry, but he would have, he had your complete, yeah, you had his com undivided he, attention he for that feel, entire time. Whatever the truth, he made me feel that way, and um, I guess that's why... Uh, even federally, I thought, you know, maybe this is a guy I can vote for. Even if the politics weren't always there, I just, you wanted to, you wanted to find an excuse to vote for the guy. Yeah. It's a powerful thing. Yeah. Well, um, the, Jack, Brian mentioned it, was a musician. And I'm still having a hard time talking about Jack in the past. In the past tense. Um, but he was. Uh, he played the piano well. He also played the saxophone. He played about three notes on it. My husband, who worked for Jack for a number of years, has one of his saxophones. And they used to play together. But um, Jack, after the Blue Jays many years ago, won, a, um, won the championship. Jack was out there on the street with all the people going by, playing his three notes on the saxophone, <laughs> cheering everybody on. That's the kind of thing he also did. He was fun. Jack liked to have fun. And he sought out fun. And he brought that kind of laughter and fun to people's lives. But what Jack did also, and we're all talking about this, and he, you know the adage that all politics is local? Mm -hmm. Well, that's Jack. Even though he cared about international issues again, as well, I saw Stephen Lewis on TV today talking about that. Uh, but he understood from his municipal days. And he really did bring that to the leadership and to, um, to his, his role as the leader of the op uh, official opposition. And in, a, in the same way that you talked about, when he was talking to you, as David said about that speed bump, he really was concerned. He really was at the, those 15 minutes or whatever it was, he was there with you because he did understand how important <laughs> these things were. And people started to pick up on that. And I will say as well, and we, Brian and David alluded to this, Jack worked very hard in Quebec. You know, the idea that it was a kind of fluke, 
I remember when he was first elected, he said, I'm going into Quebec. And there were some arguments with the party about the resources. Let's not waste our resources in Quebec. It's not from He's, the team. I mean, we always agreed oh, I don't that mean it was you. the road No, forward. the team supported him fully. It was an uh, overnight success that took nine years, for sure. It, yeah, <laughs> uh, the team, no, but he did get support from the important, he had to get some support. But there was, you know, people were dubious about that. But he was determined to do it, and he went in there fully confident that he was going to be able hmm. to do it. Brian, let me get you to comment on this. We've been getting tweets throughout the course of the evening and putting them up on the screen. We got one here that said, the loss is more than a headline for my generation. Jack convinced us Ottawa didn't have an age requirement to participate. There are, I guess there are a bunch of, what, 19 and 20 year olds who are part of the NDP caucus in Quebec because of this thinking. Is that fair to say? Yeah, we're, uh, we're always being really careful to be really uh, polite to those young new MPs because we all know we're going to end up working for them. Um, <laughs> and they are uh, uh, an amazing new young team. And I mean, Jack Layton has built the bones of a new Democrat team that will be there for 30 years, 30, 40 years, right? People, he has recruited a whole new generation. The last leader of the NDP who really did that was Tommy Douglas, right? Who built the foundation. And, and then after incre he died, and he said the party was finished too, which some people are saying today. We'll hold off on that for discussion. Well, I look at his letter. He spoke directly to that. Mm -hmm. And he said, some will say, stop doing the work. Some because, but it's all about more than about one, one leader. And this is another thing that I think Merritt's saying that's critically important. He thought about that a lot. He thought about, his, about building something that was there to last. And so when, he, when we talk about these young MPs, that's just one example of how in his caucus and his strategy team, and I can tell you from my side and the strength of the party, he was building to last. And he knew that the, the, the acid test of his legacy would be what it hold after he's gone. Hmm. And so nobody can replace Jack Layton. Jack Layton couldn't replace Jack Layton. Jack Layton at the beginning of his mandate couldn't be this Jack Layton, mm -hmm. but we can continue his work. And it'll be a test for the party for sure, but one that I think you'll find they're up for. David Miller, when you ran for mayor, did he endorse you? I can't remember. I can't either. I actually yes, don't think. Yes, he did. No, I eventually don't think he did. He did. Well, it may be, I don't think he did. No, no, which is why I'm asking not the question. Not at the top, but I think he did eventually. Did I, he not? I'm not, no, I don't think so. No, he stayed out of it. But I, don't, I don't. I don't remember to be honest. Um, I do remember some other people who didn't endorse <laughs> me, but this isn't about me. I th uh, my, my recollection is we're going back now a little bit, right? This is 202? two o two. Two thousand three. Two o three when you but you threw your hat in the ring before that, didn't you? Or maybe early the year. Anyway. My recollection is you sought his support, and he wasn't there immediately for it. And I wonder whether that created any, any sort of discord between the two of you for a while. Just to be clear, I, d I didn't seek his support, um, but I, I don't believe uh, Jack or Olivia endorsed me during the campaign. Um, and uh, uh, I never had any issues with Jack. Jack and I got along extremely well. We saw some issues differently. Um, I think he did with anybody, uh, even uh, the person in the mirror. You know. Uh, but uh, we, we always, always had common goals. And you know, one of the places that I saw Jack work that I personally learned a lot of lessons from uh, was at FCM. And I mentioned earlier how that helped build him as a national figure. Mm -hmm. It also resulted in real change for Canadian municipalities. And he laid groundwork in bringing people <laughs> together that the big city mayors were able to, to build on when I became the mayor. And you know, this was years later. But the groundwork had been laid of a national consensus. Uh, ultimately, he was very influential as the leader of the NDP and, and Paul Martins uh, bringing in significant funding for cities. That all help, happened because that consensus had been built. And I watched Jack do that and watched the way he worked um, and uh, tried to use some similar uh, methods to reach out to big city mayors. And we were very, very successful. Jack laid the groundwork for that. And, and he was somebody, uh, um, you know, I, on a personal basis, uh, got along with very well. And he you know, didn't hesitate to offer advice. He also didn't hesitate to step back when he knew he wasn't needed. And that's pretty good quality. And he was incredibly proud, I have to tell you that, of uh, when David was elected as mayor of this city and continued to be. Oh, he, he was very he, gracious. And he showed it, didn't he? Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, some people are going to think it's unseemly for me to ask this next question, but I do ask it because lots of people in the country are going to be asking this question today, even today, and so we're going to spend a little bit of time on it as we approach, I guess, about 50 minutes left in our program here. Uh, his absence, John, you first, his absence at the head of this party may send some people to conclude, since they think he was a one-man band that got 100-plus people elected in the first place, that the NDP is now going to go back to its regular spot. Uh, 
Let's get into some discussion about the future of the NDP after Jack Layton. What do you see? I think it's very difficult to speculate, in, in part because it's four years before a federal election. Uh, four years, I mean, you might as well be talking about 40 years. Um, also, you know, Canada is an unpredictable country. Um, you know, I, I never would have predicted, you know, if you asked me 10 years ago whether Stephen Harper uh, was going to be you know, a three-term prime minister, I'd said, you know, that's, are, you, are you crazy? Uh, if you told me the NDP was going to have more than 100 seats, I would have had the same response. Um, who knows who is going to emerge as a leadership candidate? Obviously, it matters who the leader is. Uh, I, I would guess that the leader a year or two or three years from now of the NDP um, will be someone who we might not even know about right now. Mm -hmm. uh, and that could be a person who surprises us. What I, what I do think is that the sheer momentum that Leighton built up is possibly going to drive our political dynamic toward what I think is a, is, is a crucial point, which is people talking about the possibility of an NDP liberal merger. You know, the last couple of years we've seen people talking about that, obviously very strong emotions on both the liberal and NDP side, but if it hadn't been for the success of Jack Layton, no one would even be talking about that. And um, you know, frankly, I think that is where Canada is going to end up. It's, it's where most developed countries end up uh, with a two-party system. And ultimately, I, I do think that will be his legacy if the NDP can find a leader to create pressure on the liberals to drive toward that point. Well, we know the current Brian, the current leader of the Liberal Party of Canada, who was on this program earlier, is a fan of that idea. Did that idea just move forward a little bit today? Uh, and Bob certainly said something interesting there. There's no doubt about that. I mean, I, I guess what I have to report is that we had quite a debate about this at our party convention in June. Um, and there was a motion put forward on the floor. Um, in fact, I believe it was by uh, party members from Bob's riding proposing to rule out any, any, co any uh, cooperation of any kind with the Liberals. And we had quite a lively debate about it. And people remembered what we've just been saying about Jack, which is that Mr. Layton and the approach that I think is now part of the NDP's DNA is to work with other people and to look for opportunities to work with other people and to focus on getting things done. And so I think at the end of the day, um, a quite resounding majority of our convention voted down such a motion on the argument we should leave our doors open. And so I think there's no point going any farther right now. I mean, there's no dance partner. Uh, the, the realities of, you know, let's listen to what he said. He said, we made a mistake in the Liberal Party in rejecting your proposal. Hmm. But they did reject it. And the weight of the discussion in that party right now is, no, never, we're not going there. We know we're entitled to office. Everything will come back soon. And as long as that's the discussion, there's no, there's not, there's no conversation to be had. At, at our end, I think we just recommitted ourselves to what worked. That position I mean, was two leaders ago, mind you. Things we'll may see, have changed. Uh, we'll see what happens in the future. As we just heard, four years is 40. Um, mm -hmm. But I think we're, we're basically where the Democrats are coming from is we haven't closed any doors. We're willing to work with anybody who's willing to work with us to get our agenda done. And uh, Marilyn, we'll just I know, have to see where it goes. Sorry, Brian. I, I know you're a judge now, and therefore you have no political opinions anymore. But since you're here, you don't mind my asking, about your former party, uh, how would you, reg with, with Jack Layton no longer the leader of the federal NDP, how would you uh, contemplate What's going to happen between those two parties going forward? Well, you're right, Steve. I, I, I can sit here and talk about the past and my dear friend Jack, uh, but I really can't talk about partisan politics. But furthermore, I don't, I, I'm incapable of doing it right now. I haven't made that leap forward anyway. I knew that Jack was very ill and was not, probably not going to make it. But I'm still in shock, and I haven't made that real leap forward. I, I just can't imagine this world right now without Jack. And so I can't even begin to go there. I think you're asking good questions, but for two reasons, I can't answer them. Oh, fair enough, fair enough. David Miller? Well, I, I think the idea that um, Jack Layton's absence from the NDP means that all of the gains disappear overnight is, is very poorly thought out. And, you know, we've heard uh, tonight, you know, Jonathan Kay from the National Post talking about how he is a constituent related to his MP. I mean, the, the NDP has elected some extraordinary people, not just in Quebec. Look at Toronto. Mm -hmm. um, and elected them in places that uh, a few months before people were saying, oh, no, it's all, you know, all conservative. Well, it isn't. And uh, members of parliament have a tremendous opportunity, particularly uh, some of the, the younger people who are very energetic, very principled, and will be out there working with their constituents for the, for the next four years. And obviously people voted for them because of a sense of shared values. 
And let's step back a, a well, moment. You sure about that? Yes. Yes, I am. Actually, I don't. They didn't I, just vote for him because they liked the leader. Th they didn't just vote for Jack because he had a cane. You know, it's what he stood for and how he communicated it. And sure, he was a tremendous uh, leader in this election and in the buildup. Uh, but the party systematically, you've heard, heard Brian talking about it earlier, systematically worked uh, to reach out to people. And, um, you know, the, the Harper government has a majority government, uh, but got a little bit more than 40% of the vote. The NDP got around 30%. And people who voted that way, it was a, and it was a breakthrough for them, there's a huge opportunity for them to vote that way again. What are timeless Canadian values? Tommy Douglas, the values he represented are timeless. Medicare. You know, medical care. It's a huge issue in Canada, and the vast majority of people support our publicly funded uh, system. That's, a, that's an NDP value. Pensions, other values like that. He, he connected those values with people uh, and, and sort of empowered them to vote for the NDP in perhaps a way that hadn't been done before. Uh, but that connection is a really powerful one. And when you have some of these superb young people out there uh, working for the next four years, you're building a base uh, that will be very difficult uh, to erode. It's a very strong base. It's not just about Jack. And the preparation he did personally, uh, I, I think, will stand the party in very good stead. Of course, you know, who knows what's going to happen in an election, but I don't think you can just sort of with the back of your hand, not that you were trying to, but say, well, you know, Jack's very tragic and untimely death has undone uh, the New Democratic Party. I think that's far from the truth. No, I hear you, but, but there will be, Brian, some people who will say, you only won 59 seats in Quebec because people like Jack and Jack is no longer there, therefore, all of what he built is at risk. I mean, that's out there tonight in the country, for sure. How do you counter that? Well, I think our friends in the Liberal Party learned uh, that there's no entitlements in politics and that you need to keep re-earning your mandate. And so I would say that the 59 MPs in Quebec, like the whatever it was, 44 MPs elected in the rest of the country and the extra 100 that we're going to aim for next time around, we're going to have to earn their mandates. And so just as David was saying, they're going to have to they're going to have to take some of that Jack energy and make it happen in their writings and learn from him in one Lego block at a time. And yes, the party is going to have to renew its leadership now, tragically. And yes, we're going to have to find more to say because now people of Canada are looking at us as, you could be the government. And you could be the government is a great challenge. But you know what? It's a fabulous problem to have. As opposed to the other problem. As opposed to what we, is, no we one used to wrestle with. And um, I think mm -hmm. people in the party will continue to be excited by that challenge and eternally grateful to Jack for the fact that that's an opportunity that we've got to pursue. Let me get all of you, just as we go into our uh, remaining five minutes here or so, to talk about something that's a, a little off the beaten path, but I did notice it at the, at the press conference where you were sitting beside him, Brian, and, and that is that here was a man who clearly was in trouble in terms of his health. I mean, he looked gaunt. He sounded weak. And yet, he's a man in public life. <laughs> And so there, I read anyway this sort of sense that even though I am in public, maybe dying right now, I have to give everybody in the country the sense that there is a tomorrow. And I wonder what it is about, well, this is more a commentary, I guess, Marilyn, you first, about public life, where in some respects, even at your worst moment, you've got to give people the sense that, you know, you can still do it, or you, you, you know, you're still engaged, you're still on the job, the sun will come out tomorrow. Is I that, think, can you I talk think, about that? Yeah, I can. Jack um, felt a re, an enormous responsibility to his constituents and to all of Canada. And, and let me say this, when I went to see him, and Brian, I'm sure he told you this too, that the thousands of cards and letters and emails that he got from people sustained him. He, besides the love from his family and friends, he, he, said, he, he said that he felt Canadians' affection and love, and it meant so much to him. And so thank you, Canadians, for, and, and it was genuine and he knew it. But he felt an enormous responsibility, and Brian would know more about this, but the letter that was produced, it was all about the future, and um, it's going to go forward without me. And his, his comments about people who are fighting cancer, don't give up because I didn't make it. You know, be positive. You can make it. And, and to young people, his message embodied everything that we know about Jack. But he would have done this. And I'm curious to hear what you would say about it, Brian, because you were there with him. Go ahead, Brian. But he would, want, he, he would feel that he couldn't just send anybody out 
to give that message, he would have to do it himself. Well, you know, one of the messages that I got as clearly as possible during these, these wonderful discussions we had on Saturday is Jack Layton is not a quitter. And Jack Layton does not give up his battles. Yeah. And many, many a time and many, many a setting, people have told him, you know, you will, you will not succeed. And he was never willing to accept that. In fact, his key line in the last federal election, one of the key things that people would chant along with him saying was, don't let them tell you it, it can't, can't be done. Be done. Hmm. And he applied that to his final battle. And I, I think, you know, some might suggest that what we saw at that press conference, and I did indeed sit next to him, and I was privileged to do so, was an act. It was something that he was doing because he had to politically. That is absolutely not so. That was Jack Layton. Yeah. That was Jack Layton saying, I will beat this. And even though he, what he was taking on were very high odds, and he knew it and we could see it, it's the man to, not, to, never, Let me uh, probe to never give up. With David Miller a little bit, though, you know, is there something about public life that forces you to put on a mask even when you are staring death in the face? Yes, although it's not putting on a mask. Um, when you're in a position of leadership, you're totally absorbed by it. If you're a responsible person, you have a duty and a responsibility. And Jack Layton, who, as I said earlier, was passionate about two things, politics and Olivia and his family. Those were his passions. Never would have occurred for him for a moment that he would lose this battle, first of all. And if you've ever been in an election against overwhelming odds and lost, um, you know that the candidate never believes they're going to lose. And Jack would have been totally focused at that press conference, believing he was going to defeat cancer and believing in the cause that he stood for and had worked his whole life for. for. And I, I think that if, if you're um, uh, the best caliber of politician, that's how you approach all your challenges because your entire life is that. Every waking moment uh, is that. And it certainly was with Jack. He, he was a consummate politician. He was consumed by it. He was blessed by the fact that his life partner was uh, um, also an elected official. And, and in that moment, uh, what I saw at least watching on television was all of those qualities of Jack coming through. His courage, um, his absorption in, in his position of leadership, his belief in the principles of the New Democratic Party, all of that when he said, I'm going to fight this and I'm going to be back fighting for families in September, he meant that exactly. It would have been impossible for him to believe anything else. Just not possible. Um, and it wasn't a matter of presenting the, the best of a difficult situation. That's the only situation, as he saw it, that's the only way he could have done it. John Kane with the last 20 seconds. Look, in a way, politics hasn't changed much in the last 10,000 years. Whether you are a chieftain sitting around a fire or a modern political leader, you have to project strength and confidence. And that's something that Layton did first to last. And it's, it's no surprise that he did it even in his final days. I think it's something we all admire. I want to thank all of you for coming in tonight on a sad day for Canada. Marilyn Shirley, the former Ontario NDP cabinet minister, shared a riding with Jack Layton. They were both the MP and MPP for Toronto Danforth. There's Brian Topp, the president of the Democratic Party of Canada today. David Miller, the former mayor of Toronto, now the Futures of Cities Global Fellow at the, excuse me, at the Polytechnic Institute of NYU. How about that? And Jonathan Kay, columnist with the National Post. Thanks so much, everybody.